Okay, panelists, we are live and I want to welcome those who are watching via either the Wyoming PBS YouTube channel or Facebook page. My name is Craig Blumenschein. I'm the senior public affairs producer from Wyoming PBS and we have a very important topical and timely panel here for you to view this evening. The title of the panel is The Nation of Laws, a Fair and Impartial Judicial Branch. It's a panel discussion and <clears throat> what we hope to do here is to provide a present day view and a historical view as well of our nation's judicial branch. This panel is being conducted via Zoom and also live streamed on the Wyoming YouTube and Facebook pages. Also, this panel discussion is being recorded for potential rebroadcast later this year on the Wyoming PBS network and also for use in Wyoming PBS's learning media assets, which are used in classrooms across Wyoming. We invite viewers of the live stream to submit questions if you happen to think about them during the event. Questions will be vetted and then relayed to me for consideration. You can email your questions to us at any time during this live panel discussion to justice at wyomingpbs.org. That's justice at wyomingpbs.org. Wyoming PBS is the copyright holder for this panel discussion, and we anticipate the panel to last between 90 minutes and two hours or so. We have some supporters of this discussion that I would like to recognize, and here they are. Wyoming PBS, the Montana Judges Association, the Wyoming District Judges Conference, the University of Wyoming College of Law, the University of Montana's Alexander Blewett III School of Law, the Montana Trial Lawyers Association, the Montana Defense Trial Lawyers Association, the Wyoming Trial Lawyers Association, the Wyoming State Bar, the Wyoming Defense Lawyers Association, and the State Bar of Montana. We've also had publicity support from Montana PBS. The order of events tonight is fairly straightforward. We'll introduce the panelists, then we'll get right to questions and their answers, and then we'll give each panelist, if they want to, to have some closing thoughts or closing remarks. So let's begin with our introduction of panelists. We have three panelists from Montana, and panelists, if you might, just raise your hand and wave so people can see who you are as I introduce you, that would just be great. The Honorable uh, Donald W. Malloy, U.S. District Court Judge for the District of Montana. Judge Malloy was nominated to the U.S. District Court by President Bill Clinton in 1995. He served as Chief Judge in the U.S. District Court District of Montana from 2001 to 2008, and then assumed senior status on August 16, 2011. Judge Malloy, thank you very much for joining us. The Honorable Susan Waters, U.S. District Court Judge for the District of Montana. Judge Waters was appointed to the U.S. District Court by President Barack Obama in 2013. Judge Waters is the first woman Article III judge appointed to the U.S. District Court for the District of Montana in the history of the state of Montana. Judge Waters, welcome to you. Thank you. And finally from Montana is Bob Carlson. Mr. Carlson was the president of the American Bar Association, the largest association of lawyers in the United States in 2018 and 2019. His presidency was a culmination of decades of involvement with the ABA during which he was a member and chair of many of its committees, including the ABA Board of Governors and the ABA House of Delegates, the ABA's policymaking body. Uh, Mr. Carlson, thank you for joining us. Thank you. We also have three panelists from Wyoming. The Honorable Nancy Friedenthal, U.S. District Court Judge for the District of Wyoming in 2010, following a presidential appointment and Senate confirmation. Judge Friedenthal became the first woman appointed to the federal court in Wyoming and the seventh federal, federal district judge in the state's history. Judge Friedenthal, thank you for joining us. The Honorable Alan B. Johnson, U.S. District Court Judge for the District, district of Wyoming. On October 22, 1985, Judge Johnson was nominated by President Ronald Reagan to a new seat on the U.S. District Court for the District of Wyoming. He served as Chief Judge from 1992 to 1999. He remains the last judge appointed by a Republican president to the District of Wyoming. Judge Johnson, great to see you. And also with us tonight is the Honorable Marin, Marilyn Kite, former Chief Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court. Justice Kite was appointed to the Wyoming Supreme Court by Governor Ger Jim Geringer in 2000 and retired, retired in 2015. Justice Kite was the first woman to be appointed to Wyoming's highest court as a Supreme Court Justice and later became Wyoming's first female Chief Justice. Judge Kite, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you. Assisting us behind the scenes this evening for tonight's panel discussion are Mr. John Vincent, attorney at law from Wyoming, and Mr. Greg Monroe, attorney at law from Montana. I want to note that a detailed and complete bios of all the panelists can be viewed at wyomingpbs.org justice if you would like to go there and take a look. 
In 2019, there were 83.2 million cases filed in our country state courts. Also in that year, there were 357,000 civil cases and 110,000 criminal cases pending in the U.S. District Courts, and the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to hear 74 cases in its 2019 to 2020 term. The news today reflects the fact that the judicial branch is involved in issues including elections, Supreme Court nominations, criminal trials, and even America's trust in the judicial system. The goal of this discussion tonight is to provide a history of the judicial branch from what the framers of the Constitution had in mind to what it is today and how judges depend on our government's executive branch to honor and enforce, and enforce court decisions. Portions of what we cover tonight will be a review for some, but as we progress into present day questions about the judicial branch, we hope our audience will gain a broader perspective and understanding of its critical role. For each question, I will call on one or two of our panelists to answer and then allow comments from any of the panelists for every question. So if the panel is ready to go, I would like to, to start the Q&A uh, questions here. And our first one is this. Our founders declared independence from British rule in 1776. In the Declaration of Independence, what were the founders' complaints about British courts? And Judge Waters, I'd like to start with you if I could. Well, the complaints that they had about the British, British courts was first, they said that the King of Great Britain had obstructed the administration of justice by refusing the, his assent to the laws for establishing uh, the judiciary powers. Second, that, uh, that the King had made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount of payment of their salaries. And third, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury. And so when they wrote the United States Constitution, they made sure that they addressed these complaints within that document. For example, in Article 3, Section 1, they stated in that document that the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their officers, offices during good behavior and shall not or shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office, which seemed to address the first and second concerns that they had. And then in Amendment 6 to the Constitution, they wrote that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed and to have the assistance of counsel for the defense. And Amendment 7 also provided for the right of trial by jury in civil cases. So, and then I think we have a slide that, that uh, shows the supremacy clause that they included in Article Six, Section 4 of the Constitution. So those were their complaints with regard to the British courts and what the founders endeavored to include in the United States Constitution to address those complaints. Judge Johnson, would you like to add? Well, let me think for just a minute and to reflect that in 1689, 100 years before the adoption of the present constitution of the United States, Great Britain and Englishmen received a Bill of Rights that guaranteed uh, trial by jury uh, for all Englishmen. The colonies weren't treated that way uh, by the King of England. He controlled the courts he controlled what happened. If he didn't like the decision, the judge paid. He wasn't, uh, didn't receive compensation or was fired. In addition, the judges uh, in the courts in the colonies were oftentimes the lieutenant governor or governor of the colony, a person who was uh, uh, served not only in the role of a governor, but also in the role of a judge 
and also oftentimes served in addition in any councils in the colony as well. With those multiple roles, it was impossible for the judges to be fair, impartial, and uh, hear the concerns. So, you know, the, the wonderful words that start the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. We hold these rights to be inalienable, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Clearly expressing where this country intended to go and was willing to fight a four-year war against a major European and world power in order to achieve that liberty. It's an amazing document, largely written by none other than Thomas Jefferson. So let's go on a little farther in, in the Constitution and talk about the design of our government under the federal Constitution. And Judge Johnson, if you want to continue on, um, that would just be wonderful. Well, I'd be happy to. It just takes us now a number of years later, after that four-year war, and I think in all fairness, we can say that constitutions often followed wartime when the country was trying to find, any country was trying to find a way to uh, go forward after a, a cataclysm. The United States, after the war, had formed Articles of Confederacy, which left really the power of government in the hands of each of the states. And after uh, ab about seven years, it was discovered that it wasn't working. Uh, the uh, states uh, each were running, they were issuing their own money, uh, they were uh, running their uh, ports, uh, they were determining who would come into their, each state, and the result was disaster. So on May 14th of 1787, uh, representatives from each state gathered for the purpose of trying to save the Articles of Confederacy and maybe make it better. But there was a secret agenda that was held in that uh, Philadelphia group. And they, they realized that a constitution needed to be developed. Uh, James Madison was uh, an important 36-year-old uh, scholar. George Washington, 55 years old, had led this nation through that four-year war. Ben Franklin, thought to be a great conciliator, 81 years old at that time, uh, would be looked at. And through that summer, uh, the language was fought tooth and nail. Uh, to develop this constitution, a three-partite uh, document. Uh, Article one establishes the legislative branch. Uh, the legislative branch makes the laws. It has the power to uh, uh, collect tax, uh, to operate postal services, to uh, provide for money, uh, coinage uh, in the nation uh, to determine uh, immigration issues uh, and to appoint judges, for example, and other officers and provide for them. The uh, Article 2 is the executive branch, the President of the United States as the chief executive who has the power of appointment uh, for the people that work within the executive branch to make suggestions of uh, laws that would be beneficial for the nation and to uh, communicate with Congress with regard to those matters. Also has the power of, uh, to issue commissions for the appointment of judges. Uh, all of us on the federal bench anyway have received a nomination for the president 
and the commission and through advice and consent, we're here today. Advice and consent from the Senate Judiciary Committee and Congress. Uh, and finally, the judicial branch uh, as originally established, uh, but really unformed at the time uh, that uh, the Constitution was accepted on September 17 of 1787. Uh, at that time, all of those proceedings, it's interesting, were conducted in secret, really. Very important. And you think about it, could a constitution be written today with our open society, with Twitter and Facebook and the press and people like you, Greg, out there uh, asking questions and uh, seeking answers. And in fact, uh, George Washington was very insistent that the, uh, that the matter be handled in, in, in quiet. And the arguments that went on in that room were often very loud, very contentious, and uh, a real struggle occurred during the hot months of that summer. So we ended up with a three-part constitution. Uh, and this wasn't the only constitution. Uh, New Hampshire had uh, enacted a constitution, and uh, certainly Madison was well aware of that, that document when all this started. Judge Waters, do you have anything to add? I don't think I can add anything to Judge Johnson's and we'll continue. there. We'll, we'll continue on then. <clears throat> we call ourselves a nation of laws, and we speak about the rule of law. What do we mean by the rule of law? Judge Malloy, I'll let you go here first. Okay, now I'm up. And uh, I, I think the place that I would like to start is uh, sort of a holistic approach that you wouldn't find in a dictionary, but after 25 years on the bench and thinking about these things, um, I have come to a sort of uh, broad definition of what the rule of law is. And simply stated, I think the rule of law is the way we treat others and the way they treat us. And that sounds overly simplistic, but in the legal system and in the adversarial system that we have, I mean, it isn't all judges. In fact, a better part of it is the lawyers, uh, the jurors, uh, the staff people, and when you witness over a period of time the involvement of so many people um, that it, it ends up, I think, my simple definition, it's the way we treat each other and the way um, we expect others to treat us. So the rule of law, I think the genesis of it, if you go back way too far, uh, and I'm not going there, is Aristotle and Cicero. And then as you progress through history, um, the real genesis of the rule of law in America is on the plains of Runnymede in 1215, where King John was held uh, to be something other than an autocrat. And uh, that, uh, the, the, in 1215 with the Magna Carta, uh, it really set the groundwork, which then four centuries later, and I think Judge Johnson may have mentioned that earlier, uh, for the rule of law. And um, what it is, I think it's mistaken to think of the rule of law as a set of rules. That's not what it is. But it, there are some common uh, themes or commitments, and that would be uh, under the rule of law, uh, there is the regular exercise of power as opposed to arbitrary exercise of power. It is clear under the rule of law that every person is subject to the law of the country as made in our country by the Congress. Uh, 
and that the um, doctrine, whatever the rules are that are enacted by the Congress or legislatures in the state system, they have to abide by uh, the fundamental constitutional principles, um, many of which are the result of judicial decisions interpreting uh, state or federal constitutions, but recognizing the fundamental proposition of individual rights. And if you go back to where Judge Johnson left off in 1780, uh, the constitution of the state of Massachusetts, uh, John Adams said, we are going to have a government of laws and not of men. And before that, uh, in common sense, uh, what was written there is the law is king. And so when you talk about the rule of law, uh, it is a natural law concept in many ways uh, that controls the exercise of arbitrary power. Uh, and that power has to be subordinated to well-defined principles and adherence uh, to the due process of law um, is administered by an independent judiciary, the federal and state courts. And uh, it is basically the rule by the law, uh, not by men. And uh, so that is my sort of, in a nutshell, too windy um, definition of what the rule of law is. It's the way we treat others in the way they treat us. And uh, it is cabined by the constitution and the constitutional obligations or duties of the respective branches, the executive, the legislative and the judiciary. Thank you, Judge Johnson. Do you have anything to add to that topic? That's a pretty uh, accurate statement, I think, in description, I was thinking of uh, Common Sense, which was written by the pamphleteer uh, Thomas Paine, uh, who was so active and so important during uh, those days. He said, but where, some say, is the king of America? I'll tell you, uh, friend, let a crown be placed by which the world may know that in America, the law is king. For in absolute governments, the king is the law. So in free countries, the law ought to be king and there ought to be no other. And uh, I think that's about all I can add. Thank you. Judge. Thank you. Judge, I appreciate that. I wanna remind our viewers, if you have a question that's on your mind as we go through this process, justice at wyomingpds.org is the email address that you can send those questions too. We want to continue to lay a little bit of a foundation here before we get to some other topics. And I want to expand upon what is it that we mean when we talk about the judicial branch? What is it that we mean? Just, Justice Kite, I would like to begin with you here. Well, the, the judicial branch is, first of all, is made up of a whole lot of people. You see pictures of judges before you tonight, but there's a tremendous number of people that operate within the judicial branch that are essential. Each state has a different structure for their judicial branch. In Wyoming, we have the Supreme Court, which is the court of last resort that hears appeals. We have district courts, which hear most cases, courts of general jurisdiction. Uh, they will hear cases, criminal cases regarding felonies, and they'll hear civil cases that are of larger amounts in dispute. We have circuit courts who hear smaller cases, and most cities and towns have municipal courts. So within the state, that essentially makes up our judicial branch. In each of those courts, there's, there are bailiffs and court reporters and all kinds of support people now, a tremendous amount of technological support as we try to struggle with entering this uh, 21st century, which we've been in for a while. <laughs> Uh, but that, that is what constitutes the branch. The, the judges uh, certainly in each state are selected in different ways, and I don't want to go into great detail, but in Wyoming, those judges are selected through 
it, what's called the merit selection process that has the participation of some citizens on a judicial nominating commission. So great variety from state to state concerning how those, <clears throat> those uh, courts are filled, those positions are filled. And, and, the and contentious in some states as well, I would say. Definitely. In some states, they're elected, which is a great debate nationally. There are only 16 states, I believe, that have the merit selection process where a commission made up of lawyers and citizens picks three candidates and then the governor appoints one of those three. And the hope is that they, that guarantees a qualified person is appointed by the governor. Many states, in fact, obviously the majority of states, they're actually elected. Uh, and I'll express some personal prejudice here, but it seems to me those it's very difficult to be an elected judge and still be fair and impartial because you have to run a campaign, raise money, do all the kinds of things that elected judges do. They have generated wonderful judges and don't get me wrong on that front, but in terms of a system, my understanding is Montana has essentially the same system. Uh, the selection process is really critical to the ultimate functioning functioning of the courts. And the federal process is uh, similar, but I'll, I'll let, uh, I think Judge Friedenthal talk about that in detail, but similar kinds of, of uh, structures. The, the idea is that there are courts that hear the trials where the parties present their cases, sometimes in front of a jury, sometimes in front of the judge. And those decisions have, are then appealable to a, an appellate court structure or either a Supreme Court or an appellate court. But that's what we think of when we talk about the judicial branch. And we'll talk about the difference between judges hearing cases and juries hearing, hearing cases in just a moment. Judge Friedenthal, please continue on. Well, yes. When I think of the judicial branch, I think of it not just comprised of the uh, 94 districts and 677, I think it is, authorized federal judgeships who are uh, those holding those judgeships are the trial judges. Then we have the circuit judges and, of course, the U United States Supreme Court. But I think of it as the third and equal branch of government. Uh, and we've talked about the branches from, from the slides uh, we have uh, separate but limited powers in the judicial branch. We can't legislate, uh, we can't execute the laws, uh, but we decide cases and controversies arising under the constitution, laws, and treaties. So we're essentially a, 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 uh, a branch bound to faithfully execute the law, which goes back to Judges Malloy and Johnson's comments on the importance of the rule of law. Um, we, uh, the judicial branch uh, and the concept of divided powers really protects individual liberties and our democracy itself, because the founding fathers understood that accumulation of power in one branch or in a person uh, naturally leads to abuse of power, tyranny and loss of freedom. Um, and so I, I see the judicial branch, not just as the uh, constitutionally authorized article three courts, uh, as well as the statutory authorized courts such as bankruptcy and tax, for example, but really a, a branch that protects the, uh, the individual liberties and the democracy itself by holding and protecting the power vested in the judicial branch. Um, and ultimately the rule of law and that concept of divided powers uh, I think we can't speak of that, that without emphasizing the value of that to our, um, our country as a whole. We have here, we have legal predictability, continuity, coherence. Uh, the judicial branch is really responsible for making reasoned decisions through public processes and based faithfully on the law. And so that value to the democracy as the separate and equal branch of government, I think really uh, 
uh, is a remarkable tribute to the vision of the founding fathers and to the preservation of our liberty and democracy. I think we, we had an additional question. Um, I wanna give any, of, any other judges that would like to comment about the judicial branch of government. If anyone has anything else they would like to add, I would certainly entertain that here. If not, I think we would like to, to move forward. Okay, seeing none. And um, I wanna advance forward to, by, and this is certainly topical today, to have you explain by what process are federal judges, particularly the US Supreme Court justices chosen and why is this process so important? And most importantly, what are the threats to that process? Mr. Carlson, let's hear from you first. Thanks. Well, his, the president obviously nominates every uh, federal judge from a district court level, circuit courts uh, to the Supreme Court. Historically, uh, the president, particularly with the district court judges looks to um, the leading senator of his party or the leading uh, political leader of his party to make recommendations uh, about uh, judges to be appointed to the district court. And it varies from person to person, but there's oftentimes a screening panel that makes some recommendations to that particular uh, senator or, the, uh, or in the case where there's not a senator from the president's party a leading official. Once the Senate, once the uh, president nominates a person, then there's an FBI investigation to make sure they have the right person. Uh, and there is uh, ultimately a hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee and then a vote by the full Senate uh, to confirm uh, the nominee as is required by the advice and consent provision of the US Constitution. Um, a very critical role, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a former ABA president, but uh, in this process is the evaluation that the American Bar Association uh, does through its standing committee on the federal judiciary. Uh, this is a very dedicated, talented group of individuals that serve for three years and sometimes get called back uh, to serve uh, in an ex officio capacity that conducts in-depth evaluations of nominees from the district court to the circuit court and certainly to the Supreme Court. What they're looking for is a, a sense of the, the integrity, the professional competence and the judicial temperament of a particular nominee. And it's critical to, for people to understand that it's not, a, it's not political uh, from the standpoint of the, of the American Bar Association. What we're trying to do is provide an analysis to get the best judges and justices possible uh, to serve their constitutional duties. And even though in the past several years that process has become more politicized, uh, the, the folks on this committee try to do their job. And as every one of the candidates, uh, every one of the judges on this panel know, they've been evaluated and they provide lists of people, lawyers they've worked with, other judges, staff people, friends that get interviewed. So it's a pretty in-depth approach. When it comes to the Supreme Court, it gets even more so, uh, sophisticated. There's a, a law school with all of its professors and all of the different disciplines of law are tasked to read the opinions of a particular judge or their legal writings. There's a group of lawyers who specialize in, in arguing to the Supreme Court that's asked to review the person's background, their briefs with the court, their legal opinions. So it's, it's, very, it's a very critical process that gets us to that stage where they report their findings to, directly to the Senate. And the process up until that report goes is completely confidential. So why is it critical? To, to vet justices, well, the lifetime appointment. And we want to make sure, uh, and I think the people out that are viewing want to make sure that the judges that are serving them and the justices that are serving them and interpreting the rules in the Constitution are the best possible people we can get for the job. Politics completely aside. And I think it's unfortunate that in the last decade or so, uh, politics has entered into this in, in ways that 
I think, and we'll get to this a little bit later, have a direct impact on the public's confidence uh, in the judicial system. And I think those attacks are calculated to do just that, to undermine, this, to undermine the judiciary. Mm -hmm. Just to close the question, are you suggesting that's the greatest threat then for the process, Mr. Carlson? I, you know, I don't know if it's the greatest, but it's a significant, it is a significant threat because, um, you know, when the judges are appointed, uh, it, it's, it has become commonplace in the last decade to refer to them by the president that appointed them. And that I don't know if it started out as a shorthand way, just a historical background, but now it's become a lightning rod. And, uh, you know, we, we don't have Clinton appointed judges or Bush appointed judges or Reagan or Trump or Obama. We have dedicated men and women who put, who donate their lives to public service to this country. And they do so every day. Uh, from the greatest cases to the simplest, you know, straightforward diversity, uh, personal injury cases. And they do so with, with, with talent, with enthusiasm, and with integrity. Thank you. Judge Friedenthal, what do you have to add here? Well, I think Bob did a wonderful job providing an overview of the scrutiny uh, nominees undergo and the confidentiality associated with that. Um, I know it was uh, staggering to fill out the forms and to go through the interviews. I have to say personally, the interview with the uh, representative for the American Bar Association was one of the most pleasant interviews. And I certainly uh, would agree with the need to continue with the ABA in the process to help uh, provide additional information and, and thoughts and observations through uh, the, uh, the um, senatorial confirmation. Uh, but the scrutiny that, that's involved, the FBI questionnaire goes back to age 18. And uh, it's, it's a challenge to uh, identify where you've lived and who you've been around and where you've worked. And basically almost every, uh, every month of your life has to be accounted for back to a very long uh, while. Um, but again, I think Bob uh, did, a, did a wonderful job providing an overview of that. I, I just wanted to emphasize that Again, the concept of divided authority here dovetails back to the founding fathers' fear of centralized power. We have the president nominating, the Senate uh, through the confirmation process advising and consenting, and the uh, president uh, appointing. And so you've got the division of power, you've got the scrutiny, I think uh, the biggest threat is the public perception that um, the nomination and confirmation process is primarily political as opposed to a merits-based process. And I would like to see the dialogue and, and focus move away from the politicians involved that necessarily have a role to play in the appointment of federal judges to the Again, the division of powers and the protection that affords our democracy, as well as the scrutiny uh, of everyone, you know, all the individuals. I, I even had to have my doctor um, sign a form on my health. Uh, and so there is, there is so much scrutiny involved in the judicial process, as rightly so, because federal judges are nominated for life and they're isolated from the uh, political and social pressures to afford them the best opportunity to decide the most controversial cases of the day. But the privilege of the life tenure uh, carries with it the need for continued scrutiny of the nominees through the process. Are there any other threats that we've missed here? Um, Justice Kite? Well, this, I guess this isn't a threat, but a concept okay. that I'd like our listeners to be thinking about is with the 
is the struggle to, to figure out a way to pick judges that can, that can make sure that they become impartial. And our founders struggled with that. And those of us who have studied the Constitution are, are very familiar with the Federalist Papers, which were writ written about the Constitution after uh, it was written in an attempt to convince states to adopt the Constitution. And it said specifically they chose this life tenure that Judge Friedenthal mentioned with the idea that as soon as someone is appointed, as time went by, they would become further and further influenced by those appointing them. That was the intent of our founders. That was a way in which to guarantee this in true independent and impartiality. And that is contrasted to state judges who are more, are closer to the process with which they were selected. And in states, they have to run for retention which pulls them back in some cases into a political uh, uh, environment, which people worry that that could then affect their judgment. So we've got a, we've got a system created by human beings that's trying to reach this perfect state of total impartiality, which is hard to get to, but there's a real thought given by our founders to this life tenure. <clears throat> any other, and thank you, Justice Skite, any other comment about the process of selecting, selecting federal judges and Supreme Court judge, justices? On to the next question. The Supreme Court case, Marbury versus Madison, is the seminal case in determining the role of the judicial branch of the U.S., of the United States. What did that decision say, and why is it so important? Judge Waters, we'll go to you. Well, the Marbury versus Madison case was decided in February of 1803. And some background facts are that William Marbury, he had been appointed to a justice of the peace position for Washington, DC by President Adams, just before President Adams left office and just before President Jefferson assumed office. And under President Jefferson, uh, James Madison was the secretary of state. And he failed to serve William Marbury with his commission for his justice of the peace position. And so Marbury petitioned the United States Supreme Court for an equitable re remedy in the form of a writ of mandamus. And basically what Marbury wanted the US Supreme Court to do was to tell Madison that he had to serve Marbury with his justice of the peace commission. So Marbury was suing under an act that Congress had passed called the Judiciary Act that was passed in 1789 and specifically section 13 of that act, which permitted the Supreme Court to exercise original jurisdiction over causes of action for writs of mandamus. So the question before the Supreme Court was whether that court could grant the request to issue this writ of mandamus that, and can you explain uh, briefly what that is for our viewers, Judge Waters? Well, writ of mandamus is basically, like I said, it, you're asking the court through this, through this process called a writ of mandamus for the court to order somebody to do something or not do something. Okay. And so Marbury wanted the U.S. Supreme Court to order Madison to give him his commission. And under this Judiciary Act that the Congress had passed in 1789, it permitted this US Supreme Court to exercise this original jurisdiction over causes of action for writs of mandamus. And so the question before the Supreme Court, which uh, goes to the significance of this case was whether or not the Supreme Court could issue that writ of mandamus, whether or not it could take up this case and tell uh, Secretary of State James Madison that he had to give um, Marbury his, con his commission. And so uh, the, the decision was written by uh, Chief Justice Marshall. It was a unanimous decision, but uh, Marshall framed the decision uh, by asking three questions. First, did Marbury have the right to the commission? Second, was a writ of mandamus the proper remedy? And third, could the Supreme Court issue such a writ? And uh, Chief Justice Marshall determined that Marbury had the right to the commission and that a writ of mandamus was the proper equitable remedy 
for getting uh, Madison to issue that commission. So the first two questions, the answer was yes. But as far as the third question, Marshall determined that the Supreme Court did not have the right to issue the writ of mandamus. And he determined this by finding that the law under which Marbury had sued and was seeking to have this writ issued, that being this Judiciary Act of 1789, violated Article Three, Section Two of the United States Constitution. So Chief Justice Marshall held that the Judiciary Act exceeded the original jurisdiction that was given to the court in the United States Constitution, and that the United States Constitution trumped this legislative act of Congress. Specifically, Marshall determined that the Supreme Court didn't have original jurisdiction to hear Marbury's petition based on this Article Three, Section 2, Clause 2 language of the Constitution. And just for our viewers, we talk about original jurisdiction. That would be a case that could be filed in the, Supreme, in the U.S. Supreme Court over which they had jurisdiction that hadn't, been, hadn't started in a district court and kind of made its way up on appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. So that was the issue here. Could the court have original jurisdiction? And the Constitution said, quote, in all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, and those in which the state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all the other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction. So Marshall determined that the Supreme Court only had appellate jurisdiction over this issue that was presented by uh, the Marbury petition, um, despite what the Judicial Act of 1789 said and section 13 of that Judiciary Act authorizing the Supreme Court to have jurisdiction over these writs was unconstitutional. So the significance really of the holding in Marbury versus Madison was that it established the US Supreme Court's power to determine whether a law passed by Congress was constitutional, which is what we call judicial review. And prior to Marbury versus Madison, it was clear that laws that conflicted with the Constitution were, were invalid, but it wasn't, hadn't been determined which branch of government would determine the validity of laws. And so that had not yet been established. And through this, uh, this decision, it was the, the courts, and here specifically the United States Supreme Court, that would determine the validity of acts and laws passed by Congress. And he goes on to say in the decision, quote, certainly all those who have framed written constitutions contemplate them as forming the fundamental and paramount law of the nation. And consequently, the theory of every such government must be that an act of the legislature repugnant to the constitution is void. And it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. So that's the significance of that case, to establishing judicial review for uh, laws and acts passed by Congress. Thank you, Judge Waters. We'll move on. Anyone have anything to add to that? All right, let's continue on. A 2015 Gallup poll said that just 53% of Americans said they had a great deal or a fair amount of trust in the judicial's ability to do its job. What should judges or the courts be doing differently in order to gain more respect from its citizens? Judge Malloy, let's start with you with that question. All right, thank you. Um, I'm not so sure that uh, there's anything that judges can do specifically uh, that would bolster what people view, what their perception of the court is, but I do think that outreach in the sense of these kinds of educational programs. Um, in, in our district, we have every, um, try and do it every year, but it doesn't work all that way, where we have been able to use the attorney admission funds in the court uh, to bring in between 23 and 25 teachers of sociology or history 
and then we have a three-day seminar where we have speakers, we have judges, we have uh, law enforcement people, and and basically feed the teachers. The effort is that you know uh, if you get the teachers and the teachers get informed in ways that they were most of them unaware of, I think then that reaches the kids that are in school. Now, whether that means people will have more respect or less respect for judges, I don't, I don't have any view on that, other than the things that Judge Freudenthal talked about in her last answer and that Bob Carlson mentioned when he was talking about selection of the Supreme Court. Um, I think those are all important issues and if people could somehow agree to disagree, I think uh, there are lots of uh, opportunities in the judicial system to disagree because it's an adversarial system. There are different interpretations of the law. There are various arguments about how the constitution is interpreted and it takes the reasoned approach of the litigants and jurors uh, to come to some sort of um, acknowledgement of what actually is involved. And uh, I can tell you in talking to jurors over a 25 year period, uh, many people are reluctant to come to serve as a juror. And I can only think of one instance in 25 years where a juror said something that they were reluctant to serve, but every other juror that, and that's thousands that I have dealt with, have said after sitting as a juror, they felt they really learned something and they had confidence uh, in the system. So I don't think there's any active role other than trying to help educate that judges can do. And, uh, you know, we don't have PR people that we can send out. So I think that's what my view is. I appreciate that. Judge Friedenthal, anything to add on whether the courts can do anything differently to gain more respect from citizens? Well, I would observe that I, I don't uh, believe polls are a very accurate measure of public respect of judges and courts. It's like polls on politicians. People seem to disrespect politicians, but love their own elected leaders. And so um, we, we uh, don't know what is captured in the public's mind when questions like that are presented. That, but that doesn't mean that we don't have a job to do to earn trust and respect from the public. First of all, attitudes are formed by public opinions about often decisions that none of us are involved with. Uh, they're decisions that are part of the news nationally, um, perhaps decisions at the Supreme Court level. But I think the best thing federal judges can do short of uh, pulling people in off of the streets to sit in our courtrooms and and uh, see the day the day to day business of the court is to uh, perform our duties faithfully, adhere to high ethical standards, and uh, engage in a good self governance of uh, the federal judiciary. Um, I think uh, individual judges who are good listeners, who respect their litigants, are patient deal with their litigants with dignity, give them an appreciation that they have been heard, uh, do solid research and good opinion writing, end up earning the respect. Maybe it's on a person by person basis, but I do think, uh, I do think trust and respect is earned. But, uh, but I, I did have to quibble on whether the poll is a good indicator of that. <clears throat> Others could contrast that to perhaps how other branches of the govern, government are perceived too. So but that's perhaps another discussion. Anyone else want to talk about um, the, what potentially courts could, can do or, or, or maybe do that are unseen um, relative to um, assisting with how courts are perceived? Craig, let me uh, just uh, make a, uh, oh, excuse me, Judge Johnson, you go ahead. Judge Johnson, then we'll go to Justice Kite. Go ahead. I just wanted to, uh, in a way, do a shout out here 
to uh, two of the people who are on this panel who've done, I think, quite a bit uh, through programs with the, their courts uh, that uh, offer opportunities for the public to become better acquainted with the work of the courts. Uh, first, when uh, Judge Friedenthal was uh, the chief judge in our court, uh, she instituted a program for our citizenship uh, ceremonies, which occur quarterly. That we would take those ceremonies out into the community. And uh, we conducted uh, ceremonies in, in uh, various venues, uh, schools, and uh, providing opportunities for parents, students, and others to uh, go through that activity in that environment and to see the court at work. And Judge Kite, when she was Chief uh, Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court, instituted a program of judicial education resulting in, in the Supreme Court building, a marvelous interactive a judicial education program. And you can see the school buses lined up in the spring of students going through that, uh, in that beautiful building, uh, that uh, wonderful interactive and uh, targeted education program. So there are things that can be done. We're not, we're not uh, in an ivory tower. We are the people's court. We have, these courts belong to the people and, and they're invited to come in and see and, and uh, witness what is going on. <clears throat> Justice Kite, anything to add? Well, first of all, thank you, Judge Johnson. And I, I do think there's a lot we can do to get out in the communities. But as uh, Judge Malloy was talking about, we can't hire our own PR agents. It makes me think of when I was first appointed, I, I was, Excited, of course, and, and uh, happy because I, at that time I had a six-year-old at home and I, I thought as a judge, finally, I'd get to have the last word. <laughs> and then as soon as I issued a controversial opinion, I realized that's not the case at all. And everybody gets to have an opinion, but you can't defend yourself. And I think it is important for, for the public to realize that judges cannot and are pro prohibited by the rules of judicial conduct that apply to them to defend themselves in particular cases or decisions of court. So we are in a kind of a difficult position that way. But I also think that transparency goes a long way to uh, having, and, and uh, as Judge Friedenthal said, on a case-by-case -case basis, people gain great uh, respect and, and uh, confidence in their courts. Uh, but if people having more of an opportunity to see the courts in operation. I think that helps. And people should know that they can go online today and read any, any court's opinion virtually all over the country. I think most states are now completely online. So we are more transparent than we have been in the past. As someone who has watched a, a jury trial from start to finish, I would strongly recommend that. It's, it's um, a great experience. Greg, could okay, I just follow up on what you Justice Kite just said? You and, bet, Justice Kite. And unlike any other branch of government, when a judge makes a decision, they have to write and explain why they're doing it. And you don't have that in the Congress. You don't have it in the executive office. Uh, you don't have it, it basically in many decisions made by administrative agencies. But every justice or judge that makes a decision as Justice Kite said, it's online and it's easy to criticize if you don't know what it says, but the judge has to explain her or his reasoning. And then it is subject to, if you don't agree with it, it could be reason disagreement. Thank you, very important point. So Craig, if I could just-, just Sure, Mr. Carlson. I, I'll, the judges have said that they, they don't have PR and I, they can't really. Uh, but I, for the lawyers listening, uh, it's, it's our responsibility, particularly as an organized bar, to, to educate the public and assist in the education of the public about the work of the judiciary, uh, its critical nature, and uh, the, the need to more appropriately understand and not just listen to the sound bites 
from the talking heads on a media program uh, or the headlines. Uh, you don't really know what a case is about or what the result is about unless you go through the process that the judges do, reading, reviewing the evidence, reviewing the law, and then coming to a reasoned decision. It's easy to sensationalize things, but that's not the hard fact. And to the non-lawyers in the audience, I think you should take up the invitation to go sit through a hearing or a, a portion of a trial to see what actually happens in a courtroom. Um, and hopefully someday you'll get to serve as a juror because I think that's critical uh, to our system of justice. Thank you. Moving on. Federal judges in Wyoming and, and Montana, in fact, across the country, make decisions on cases involving subjects as varied as wolves, pipelines, drug trafficking, business fraud, interstate water disputes, and child pornography. Federal judges are sometimes said to be the most powerful public officials in the United States. What's the source of their authority and what are the limits? Judge Friedenthal, let's start with you first with that question, if we could. Well, the, the source of their authority really is bounded and also limited by the constitution and the, the laws. Uh, we uh, were limited by the cases that are filed before us. Uh, one federal judge that I love dearly uh, captured it well when he said, we eat what we're served. Uh, we can't step up and wave, raise, our, raise our hand and say, you know, I, I really have a, an opinion on this issue and I just like to, uh, to write a, a legal decision on it. Um, and so we, we get cases in, in Wyoming and in Montana as well through a random draw. And, uh, our and, and our job is to decide those cases consistent with our limited jurisdictional scope uh, and the constitution and, and laws of the United States. And then uh, beyond that, as a trial court judge, I'm limited by 10th Circuit precedent, by US Supreme Court precedent, and for Wyoming, uh, for diversity cases, or uh, I'm limited by uh, the, the Supreme Court precedent for the state in which the case uh, needs to be resolved, the law of the, of the, the case. Um, and so uh, in some respects, uh, I, uh, there, there are more limitations than power, but ultimately the judge's job is to decide the case through reason research and uh, a good written decision. And if, the, if either party or both of them feel aggrieved, they can take it up on appeal and, and see what the 10th Circuit has to say. Judge Malloy, what do you have to add? Well, uh, interestingly, the first thing you said is we rule on wolves and uh, <laughs> wolves. I'm sure there's an opinion. You go any place, you'll find at least a dozen opinions. And the, the thing is, I think sometimes the public perception is, does the judge like wolves or favor wolves or dislike wolves? And that is not the issue at all. There are legal issues that are cabined by what the Congress of the United States has set in terms of the Endangered Species Act and other federal legislation and how, as Judge Freudenthal says, how those statutes have been interpreted by the U.S. Supreme Court, which we're all bound by, by the circuit, the 10th uh, Circuit for Wyoming, the 9th Circuit for Montana, and they may have different opinions on the interpretation of the same rule. So, uh, I don't think it's, I like bears, I like wolves, or I don't like bears, I don't like wolves. That's not what the issue is. And sadly, I think most of those kinds of cases where there are people that have opinions, um, it's not about the, the accuracy of the judicial determination. It's about, you know, that judge is liberal, that judge is conservative, and, and I think that's un, uh, unfortunate. I, I agree with Judge Freudenthal that uh, our courts 
are not general jurisdiction courts. We are confined by the Constitution. The state courts are general jurisdiction, but we can only do what the Congress says we can do. And if there are instances or kinds of cases, whether they're environmental or torts or uh, things that involve Social Security, whatever it is, the, the, the positive law is covered by the legislative and executive. Uh, and then it's left to the courts to interpret. And um, I'm not being critical, but a lot of times there are difficult issues that the Congress has to deal with. And some of the legislation is ambiguous. And then you have litigants and then you have to get somebody to say, well, that's right or that's wrong. And there's the whole process then, as Judge Freudenthal mentioned that, okay, the district judge has to, or jury has to decide the case. Then there are avenues to appeal to a, a court of appeals. And then in the, uh, in the federal system, you can ask for certiorari, the discretion of the Supreme Court to uh, take the case. And you mentioned when you started at the very beginning, the numbers of cases in the state courses, which are just phenomenal, the amount of work state judges have to do. And then there's, you know, roughly 400,000 in, in the federal trial courts. But the thing that stands out in those numbers, I think, is the Supreme Court decides 70 cases. And, you know, they do a nice job uh, on what they're presented, but they get to pick what cases they want. None of the judges here get to pick the case that they want to have in their court. So, um, I, you know, the power is constrained by the Constitution and by the positive law enacted by the Congress and how the appellate courts and the Supreme Court interpret uh, various laws. Thank you, Judge Boyd. We have had a couple email questions to us. I appreciate those. There's still time to submit yours. We'll get those uh, to those here towards the end of our discussion. Justice at wyomingpbs.org is the email address. Moving on, and this is a big topic um, on many people's minds. In Bush v. Gore in 2000 and in the 2020 election between President Trump and President Biden, the federal courts, in including the United States Supreme Court, resolved the disputes about who had won the elections. What's the role of the courts in election disputes and how did they get that power? Judge Beloy, I think we'll start with you here. Okay, well, um, I think the genesis of that is the question um, about Bush versus Gore, which uh, is a very fascinating case. That's where I would start. There are a number of things about it that are, are interesting. First of all, the facts. Uh, were very convoluted. And if you read the opinion, it is a per curiam opinion, which is also unusual. Up until the turn of the 20th century, per curiam opinions were basically issued by the U.S. Supreme Court saying, uh, this is so clear, we don't need to have any kind of rigorous uh, examination. That was quite different. Uh, and it changed through the 20th century. But uh, the thing that was involved was Article uh, 2, Section 1, uh, Clause 2 of the U.S. Constitution. That's sort of the genesis of the argument, which provides each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress, but no senator or representative or person, including an office of trust or profit under the United States uh, shall be appointed an elector. So that was the argument. There was all of the disputes about counting hanging chads and uh, the ballots and whether the machinery that was reading ballots was doing it accurately. Was it overcounting? Was it undercounting? And <clears throat> the debate in the United States Supreme Court, which I think was unusual, 
uh, that they took the case from the Supreme Court of Florida. The Supreme Court of Florida had ruled in the case on a couple of occasions, and uh, the general rule of the U.S. Supreme Court, because of federalism, if a state's highest court interprets the state's own law, then the U.S. Supreme Court, as a general proposition, will uh, defer to the state Supreme Court's interpretation of the law and of their own law. And uh, there were these arguments that were made uh, regarding uh, Florida law, regarding uh, the electors, and the, the rule is that uh, the legislature's choice of electors is plenary. But then they, there's the Constitution of the United States that I read that, and part of the problem was the chronological issue that the electors had to say, or the, say who their electors were by December 12th. And based on the Florida Supreme Court decisions, they could not get that done. The Florida Supreme Court kept saying, you got to go back and do it right. And there were issues about um, equal protection and the argument of due process and the question of um, what was the intent of the voters. And uh, <clears throat> the problem that the per curiam opinion uh, addressed was the standards for counting those votes differed from one county to the next, and they actually differed from one counting team to the next counting team. And so uh, the United States Supreme Court, uh, given the election, given the upcoming uh, requirement of the electors voting in Washington, D.C., and then the process where the Senate uh, counts the votes and confirms, um, given that time constraint, the U.S. Supreme Court stepped in and said there was a violation of equal protection because the Florida Supreme Court had usurped the power, the plenary power of the legislature in determining how votes were to be counted. So um, it's a per curiam opinion, but um, there were some disagreements. Seven of the justices agreed uh, with the per curiam opinion. And uh, I think the essence of it, and this goes to um, what the problem was, and I'll address the question of, uh, you know, how do we get involved now? Uh, but Justice Stevens in a dissent in talking about uh, the majority per curiam opinion said, what must underlie petitioners entire federal assault on the Florida election procedures is an unstated lack of confidence in the impartiality and capacity of the state judges who would make the critical decisions if the vote count were to proceed. Otherwise, their position is wholly without merit. The endorsement of that position by the majority of this court can only lend credence to the most cynical appraisal of the work of judges throughout the land. It is confidence in the men and women who administer the judicial system that is the true backbone of the rule of law. Time will one day heal the wound to that confidence that will be inflicted by today's decision. One thing, however, is certain. Although we may never know with complete certainty the identity of the winner of this year's presidential election, the identity of the loser is perfectly clear. It is the nation's confidence in the judge as an impartial guardian of the rule of law. And uh, when I reread that opinion, uh, it struck me that in a decision way earlier, uh, almost apocryphal by Justice Brandeis, said something 
uh, where the Supreme Court decided a case. And what he said about the case they were deciding is this then is clearly a case where it is better that the matter be decided than that it be than that it be cited right. So it's better to decide it than having to decide it correctly. Um, I don't really understand uh, why every voting issue is taken to court other than people want to win the political power through elections. Uh, the, uh, I think the, what is it? The, um, oh, the legal, uh, uh, American Law Institute published a book just recently uh, setting forth the restatement of voting rights cases. And I know there are lots and lots and lots and lots of challenges um, and some are legitimate, some are questionable. And I think it just is up to the judge acting within the constraints of our constitutional system to try and resolve those and then uh, let the cards fall where they are and then the process continues. So um, I think it's difficult for judges to be the final arbiters of elections. Uh, I know there are, there are legal issues that come up, which I understand, but uh, I just, I'm not sure how judges deciding the outcome of an election uh, comports with our democracy. Thank you. Any other comments about the judicial role in adjudicating, I guess, election outcomes for lack of a better descriptive term there that, that anyone may want to add? Well, I might just say, uh, and Judge Malloy said that at the end of his comments, uh, most of these challenges, at least this year, were based on did they properly follow the procedure of a particular state? Um, and it's different in every state and every state has different procedures, but uh, I think that that is where the court gets its power, where the, I agree, I, I think it shouldn't be exercised lightly, but they have the same power with an election, an argument that an election did not follow the statutory procedures as they would in any other case. Any other comments on, on elections and the role of the, role of the judiciary? Just, yes, Judge Johnson. Very, very briefly. And of course, Bush versus Gore historically is the only instance in a presidential election where the Supreme Court determined that election. Nevertheless, it shows uh, in these close cases that our election process is, is fragile. Uh, there are arguments that are being made today based upon earlier opinions by Justice Rehnquist that these decisions should be left exclusively with the legislature of the states to decide these questions. Leading up, whether or not uh, that takes the courts out of these cases, it shouldn't. Uh, legislatures are a, a political place, a, a partisan place oftentimes, uh, and courts uh, sh should remain. We've seen in the 33 federal cases that in this particular uh, most recent election, uh, many of the decisions that were made by federal judges uh, have been reversed because uh, under the idea that the judges uh, cannot change uh, the rules of the election close to the election time. Uh, 
where there have been efforts to extend by a day or two to afford uh, the opportunity to make sure that the mail service delivers uh, the absentee votes. So it's, uh, I think it's something that the public really needs to watch in the future. These are important issues uh, that are developing at this time and our election process is fragile and deserves uh, everyone's attention. Come back to a question about the Supreme Court, if I could. <clears throat> Few would disagree that the selection of U.S. Supreme Court justices has become politicized and partisan and that appointing young liberal or conservative justices to the court gives the president and Congress the remarkable power to impact the court decisions for 30 or 40 years because of the justices have tenure for life. Should changes be made in the tenure of justices or in the way they are chosen? Mr. Carlson, we'll let you take the first crack at that. Thanks. Um, first of all, I'm going to disagree with the premise of the, the question um, and come at it a little different way. I certainly don't disagree that the selection process has become politicized and partisan. I do tend to disagree that appointing a so-called liberal or conservative justice, which I, I have a difficult time with those labels some days, um, gives the president and Congress remarkable power uh, to impact the court's decisions for decades to come. Uh, you know, history just hasn't shown that to be the case. Um, uh, the Warren court uh, was supposed to be a conservative court, and it didn't turn out that way. Judge, I think the justices, by and large, yes, they come with different ideologies and different backgrounds. But I think that life tenure gives them some freedom to, to make a decision in a way that they think follows the law, follows the constitution, and follows their conscience. So before, I'm going to give the viewers a little bit of thought. I'm not going to directly answer the question by saying, should it, the tenure change one way or the other? But I think before, I think the what we need to do is constantly seek to improve our system of justice and make it as fair and accessible as possible uh, to the people. Changes to be made should increase the faith in the system, not decrease it. And any change will ultimately require public support and confidence. The Supreme Court as an institution is more important than any particular political moment in history. The integrity of the court and the Senate are fundamental to a functioning democracy. Any change to the makeup of the Supreme Court or the ten tenure of judges should not be done in haste or out of a claimed crisis or dissatisfaction with the opposing political party's actions or an individual or group's perception that because a judge or justice was appointed by the president from one party, that this judge or justice will always do what the president wants. You, there has to be a careful analysis of the situation. And I, I hope that there won't be a rush uh, to a perceived politically expedient approach. It's been in the news recently. Would any other, I don't know if it's difficult for sitting judges to comment, on the question, but would anyone else like to offer offer uh, additional thought here? Well, uh, Craig, I would just say that there, there could only be a change in that system if our constitution is amended. And that is a long and arduous process. And I think that's what, what Bob Carlson was mentioning. I mean, you have to have the, I think it's two thirds of all the states would have to ratify such a change. <coughs> The idea of that happening in, in uh, at any environment, let alone this, is is highly unlikely. So, it we might all muse a little bit about what could we do to change the system. But in a matter of fact, it is the system that our founders chose, and it seems more likely that we should learn to operate and be satisfied with the way it operates within within our current constitutional structure. Along the same vein, we hear complaints about judicial activism. What is judicial activism and what is judicial restraint? 
what are the limits to judicial discretion? Judge Friedenthal, you'll have this first. Well, I hear, I hear those uh, phrases and I, I tend to uh, conclude that uh, they're attributed to decisions people either like or don't like um, and uh, have really nothing to do with the uh, approach the judges take to tough issues that are presented to them. Um, so I, uh, uh, I would, I, I disagree with uh, the labels uh, and think it, it really confuses and uh, leads to a misunderstanding of the approach judges uh, take in making decisions on uh, sometimes very controversial issues. In terms of limitations, uh, there, there are, uh, apart from the limitations we've already discussed about the statutes and the constitution and the precedent and the uh, uh, state law that, that governs in diversity cases, uh, the, the court's exercise of discretion when you, uh, when you actually get down to it is fairly narrow uh, they decide what they understand the law to be. Uh, they look at the facts that are presented and undisputed. And uh, if there is an abuse of discretion, uh, then that uh, abuse of discretion is often called out through the appellate process. Um, but ultimately, I think the amount of discretion judges exercise is overstated uh, and uh, misunderstood in terms of the uh, process of uh, looking at looking at the facts presented lo and looking at the applicable law. Mr. Carlson, anything to add? Yeah, just briefly. I mean, I've been practicing law for over forty years, and. Uh, whenever I hear uh, somebody say, oh, you know, that was an activist decision or, uh, you know, they should have done something differently. I, I look at it as sort of the, <laughs> the sore loser syndrome, uh, if you will, um, you know, and in certain aspects, it gets serious because the more you say that, the more you use those labels, uh, the more it it is the easier it becomes to undermine the public's faith and confidence in the system. And it really is code for the judge didn't rule in my favor or found an act of Congress or the president unconstitutional or whatever. Judges are constrained by precedent, but the constitution was designed to be a living document. It was designed by its authors to evolve and grow with society. And it's interesting that people now use this, this phrase uh, um, that's not been around in the lexicon for very long of originalism. originalism. And, you know, uh, if, you, if you hearken back to our earlier question about Marbury versus Madison and the, the court's ability to interpret the constitution um, in a way that's appropriate and in a way that follows uh, the mores of society as it evolves, frankly, the activist judges are those, in my mind, that subscribe to the theory of originalism, because they're turning back the clock. And I'm not sure the founders envisioned that. Um, Congress doesn't always pass perfect laws either. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, the courts are constrained to interpret the laws that get passed, but sometimes those aren't as clear as one might, as the Congress thinks, and they need to be clarified. And yes, there, there can be disputes, but then the next constraint, particularly on a district court judge, is the right to appeal to, the, to a higher court and or Congress to amend the law and clarify what it actually intended. Um, and I, I, I think uh, labels are too often bandied about these days and really 
uh, if you really focus on what a judge actually did, you really have to understand the case. And that takes hard work. And before you fall prey, members of the audience, to those types of labels, I think you need to roll up your sleeves and actually dig into the facts of what happened in a particular decision. Greg, can and, I comment yeah, on that? Um, Judge Boy, then just, Justice Kite, sure, absolutely. It's an important okay. topic. So um, this is a question I, I asked unfairly of, ju of Justice Kite because I didn't know what the state situation is, but in the United States Supreme Court decisions, uh, in all <clears throat> courts, it's basically underlying what we've talked about is the idea of stare decisis. In other words, the court is bound by prior decisions, but there are exceptions. If the Supreme Court interprets a statute, then the a following Supreme Court or a differing Supreme Court cannot change the interpretation of the statute. The only way it can get changed is Congress. The Constitution, on the other hand, has been subject to various interpretations and Stare decisis is not as demanding in the federal system under the construction of the Constitution as it is the interpretation of statutes. And I think that's important. And then um, when Bob Carlson was talking, uh, I kind of had a chuckle because uh, Judge Harvey Wilkinson III, and I think uh, the other federal judges may know him, he's on the Fourth Circuit, wrote a book called Constitutional Theory. And I won't go into it except to say, one theory, the living constitution. His characterization of that is activism unleashed. Originalism, his characterization, characterization of that is activi activism masquerading as restraint. The political process theory, he characterized as a third way to go down the rabbit hole, pragmatism as activism through anti-theory. So the thing is, there are a whole bunch of different ways of looking at the Constitution, and I'm not entirely sure somebody has, that is the right one. Justice Kite? Well, I just have to repeat a, a story. I, I can't remember if I read it or heard it uh, about Justice O'Connor having seen all these accusations of activist judges. And she said, it's getting to the point that when I get up in the morning, if I go to work, I'm afraid I'm committing at judicial activism. <laughs> so, <laughs> there is a certain, you have to realize that as, as Judge Friedenthal <clears throat> said, you gotta make a decision one way or the other. Uh, so you're, you're bound to take action um, and you're following precedent as, as Judge Malloy mentioned. We'll go on to talk about juries and certainly juries are in the news as we speak today. And I'm, <clears throat> um, I think it's an important question. Juries are sometimes criticized for being unpredictable and lacking expertise to decide complex cases. How is it that juries make decisions in some cases and judges do in others? And what are the pros and cons of letting judges or juries make the decisions? Mr. Carlson, do you wanna take the first crack at this? Sure. Um, well, the Sixth Amendment guarantees a, a right to jury trial in a criminal case, and the Seventh Amendment guarantees uh, the right to a jury trial in a civil lawsuit, interestingly enough, involving claims valued at more than $20. Now, that's not much today, but when this the, the, the amendment was written, that was more than a month's salary or wages um, at that time. And so um, the, the idea behind uh, this issue that juries can't handle uh, decisions in complex cases, um, I mean, I don't, I don't agree with that and it's a fundamental matter. Um, the, uh, the parties can certainly waive a jury trial and try the case to a judge. I, over my uh, career, I've handled several lengthy trials, um, one that lasted, uh, I think, close to three months in a products liability case with highly technical engineering facts, uh, complicated medical and scientific causation issues, uh, and the jury stuck with it. 
uh, for three months. And uh, I, uh, the jury brought, a, I represented the defendants, the jury brought an adverse verdict, uh, but it was about what we expected based on the state of Montana's law and a fair result to both the defendant I represented and to the plaintiffs. Um, it is, uh, so I, when I look at making this recommendation to my client, I say, I think it's better, frankly, to, to look to 12 uh, or six uh, jurors. In the federal court, it has to be a unanimous verdict. In, um, in Montana, generally speaking, it, it's, it's tried before seven jurors, so six and the alternate, and they have to reach a unanimous verdict. Uh, because there's an interesting dynamic that takes place in the jury room. You're sitting in the jury box and you're listening to the evidence and you might come to one conclusion or bring in one set of biases and then you go into the jury box and you deliberate and you talk it over with se you know, seven different sets of ideas and, and observations and notes and everything else. Uh, and it's that dynamic process that sort of brings justice. And, you know, frankly, that's all we can expect from the system. Now, if you're looking at, I, I trust the judges on this call, but if you're looking and telling your client, I don't know exactly how, you know, Judge Malloy or Judge Waters or Judge uh, Kite or anybody feels about this particular, I don't know what their particular bias is, but I do know one thing, if they tend to go one way or think one way, there's nobody there's nobody talking to them that's going to bring them back. You know, I mean, the skill of the lawyers hopefully will help, but there's, you know, that that's a tough sway there. Uh, and, you know, judges, you know, if you think of the jury verdict that went crazy and wasn't supported by the evidence, you appeal it. Judges are very, very careful to follow the law and to write decisions, author decisions that basically unless they make a mistake of law, there is very rare and difficult to overturn. So I'm a big firm believer in the jury system. And I think for the most part, they get it right. And yes, they're celebrated cases that get a lot of notoriety, but you don't get to know what the jury saw. You don't get to, you know, those reports don't go into detail about the weeks of testimony that was presented by both sides that had to be processed. So I still think they're the best way to go. Justice Kite, what do you have to add about this discussion about juries here? Well, it, uh, first of all, it, it, uh, it certainly is the case that in, in states and in the federal system that the, whether you are entitled to a jury trial or not is established in your, the consti applicable constitution and the statutes. And uh, that's how they end up in different, in, in terms of from the public's viewpoint, it might seem uh, hard to understand, but generally speaking, if there's only a question of law, it's probably going to be a trial before a judge. Um, and if it's a question of fact involving either a criminal case or property or money, it's, it's gonna be something that a jury should decide. But I certainly agree with what, what uh, Bob Carlson just said in the regard to the wisdom of the jury. Um, you, and it's interesting that our founders there also, the, the, the right to a trial by a jury of your peers was one of the fundamental rights referred to in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution. They thought it was the way to resist tyranny, was to have the uh, citizens decide their own fellow citizens' fate. And, and it's, so it's critically important to our, our democratic system. I had the unlikely privilege, I'm not sure maybe some of the others on the panel have done so as well, but usually lawyers are sworn off of juries. Early in my practice, I was left on a jury by total surprise to me, but it was a very fascinating experience. It, it happened to be a, a rape case. I felt like I could be fair, but you can imagine your own personal uh, feelings coming in because you're a human being. But watching that jury deliberate and the very different and disparate opinions and thoughts gel around a certain position that everybody felt comfortable with just in, uh, enhanced my belief in, and, uh, in juries and in the, the power of their collective wisdom. So I don't think there's a, I mean, obviously if there's a big case that has a, a lot of technical 
uh, issues in it. Sometimes it's a struggle for juries and they have to work extra hard and the judges, the lawyers have to work extra hard to make sure everybody understands the issues, but they're perfectly capable of deciding them. Any other comments about juries that the panelists would like to make? <clears throat> We're gonna skip ahead just a little bit. Um, I, there are three questions I wanna make sure we get to and we have about 20 minutes left. So we're at question, what we call 15A, why are cases thrown out before trial? What's the role of evidence in deciding whether a case moves to trial? Judge Waters, if we could, I'll have you start with that, uh, that question. Well, um, I was thinking of like civil cases, for example, and there are a few things that might come into play that would cause a case to get thrown out before trial. Um, the first that I was thinking of is just if the court lacks jurisdiction over the case. And it's been mentioned uh, in a couple of comments in answer to a few of these different questions that the federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction and the state courts are uh, courts of general jurisdiction. And what that means is that there, there are only a couple of ways that you can get your case into federal court because of that limited jurisdiction. And that is uh, if you have diversity of citizenship, which means that your case uh, involves citizens of different states or involves uh, US citizens and someone from another country, for example. And then you have to have damages of over $75,000. Or your case may involve a federal question, uh, which are cases that involve the United States government, the United States Constitution, uh, federal laws and controversies between different states and controversies between the United States and foreign governments. So uh, there could, you could file a case in federal court, for example, and the opposing party could challenge whether or not the federal court had jurisdiction over that case. And if the court determined it did not, then that might be a reason that the, the case would be thrown out as to say, uh, at least of the federal court. And um, I was a state court district judge for 16 years. And of course those state courts are courts of general jurisdiction. And so they have a much bright, broader uh, caseload as far as the kinds of cases that, that state court uh, judges decide. And the term general jurisdiction means that the court has jurisdiction over all persons found in that particular state. And they have jurisdiction to hear criminal cases and civil cases, uh, probate, divorce, um, all kinds of different cases. Um, and then they have appellate jurisdiction over city courts and municipal courts and justice courts. So um, there, it, it, there are oftentimes uh, the situation in federal court where a civil case has been filed in state court and then um, the defendant re removes the case to federal court and then it might, there might be a challenge there as to whether that was appropriate or not. And if the federal court determines that they don't have jurisdiction, then it would be remanded or sent back to the state court where it originated. So that's one situation where a case could get thrown out of the federal court before it ever went to trial. And there isn't really much that evidence has to do with that kind of a situation. Um, there's also the situation where maybe there's an argument of whether the, there's a failure to state a claim upon which relief could be granted or, um, and then with summary judgment, then evidence really becomes involved in that. But, uh, I know we have a couple other judges on this question, so I'll defer to them. Judge Johnson or Judge Friedenthal, what would your comments be here? Judge Friedenthal? Well, I, uh, I, I again, will, want to take issue with some of the terminology because I think it leaves a misimpression. Uh, in the general public, this idea that my, my case was just thrown out. Uh, we, we don't, uh, uh, I have no garbage can for throwing cases <laughs> into. Uh, you, uh, there, is, there are screening processes, particularly if, uh, 
if uh, the uh, party is seeking to file in federal court without paying the fees, we're required to screen cases. Uh, Judge Waters talked about the basic screening of jurisdictional issues, uh, failure to state a claim. We have other uh, issues that can preclude the judge from reaching the merits of the case or dealing with the facts as pled such as failure to exhaust administrative remedies or statutes of limitations. But still there is an order entered that says in a detailed fashion why this case cannot proceed further in federal court. Sometimes that offers the plaintiff an opportunity to amend to try to do a better job to state a claim, which should be afforded. But um, there still at the end of the day is, is an order. And then uh, in terms of the life of the case, you have the motion for summary judgment uh, deadlines in, uh, in courts that allow litigants where facts are not disputed to present their arguments on the law as it is applied to the facts and the inferences in favor of usually the plaintiff, the non-moving party. <clears throat> and uh, those end up as well, not getting to a jury for fact finding because there is no need to find facts and the judge can grant summary judgment. Uh, those, those are decided on the merits, uh, just on the merits uh, with the conclusion that the court agrees that there are no disputed facts. Uh, if there are facts to be found, then the case heads into uh, the stage of the jury trial process. But um, uh, there, there are, there are uh, different locations or places in the evolution of a case where the parties can, can challenge whether the case should move forward. Thank you. Judge Johnson, you can tie this question up. Well, I'd only, I agree with Judge Friedenthal. We don't just throw away cases. Uh, we haven't talked really about the criminal docket. There may be a defect in the indictment or the charge. And there are a number of ways that can arise, although it is very rare in this day that uh, the case is uh, sent back or dismissed because of a problem in the way the charge is framed. But more frequently though, uh, we have issues on the criminal side of, of uh, a improper search and seizure or uh, uh, improper arrest uh, that may affect whether or not evidence can be received in the case and the case can go, go forward routinely. Uh, the judges on the federal side and state side hear motions to suppress evidence that are brought by the defense. And we hear the circumstances under which that evidence is, is uh, obtained. And if it violates uh, constitutional principles, uh, the motion to suppress is granted. And for all practical purposes, oftentimes the case can't go forward because critical evidence has, has been excluded from, from the trial. Uh, the whole idea of excluding evidence is, is one that uh, has been discussed in the US Supreme Court and uh, continues to be one that scholars uh, debate over as to whether or not that is a fair and reasonable uh, way that uh, criminal cases should be disposed of. Uh, I, can I can see situations where in a high profile case, a suppression issue may result in no trial and a very dis disappointed public. Uh, but that's the law at this point. Moving on and we're gonna get to one more of our planned questions. And the question I'd like to ask is, how, and we've talked about it briefly, 
um, previously, but I think it's important. How do judges supervise each other? And how and when do judges make decisions to recuse themselves from a case? I think both of those questions are important. Justice Kite, I'd like you to start with that one, if you could, please. <clears throat> well, the judges in the states and in, in the federal system have uh, a code of judicial conduct that they have adopted. Uh, and it spells out your obligations in terms of your, your ethical obligations as you perform your, your functions. Um, you're obligated to uphold judicial independence and integrity and impartiality. Uh, you're prohibited from involving yourself in political activity. You're required to conduct your, act, your personal conduct to, to minimize any risk of, of uh, conflicts with cases that you have. You're prohibited from having what we call ex parte, which means just one side. You're, you're prohibited from talking to one side of a case if, those representing one side of a case, unless the other person is present. So you have some um, essential uh, guardrails in terms of your operation and they are established by rule. And it's different in the federal system and, and the state system, but the methods of enforcing those uh, rules of conduct in Wyoming, we have a, a commission on conduct and ethics that hears complaints about judges, whether they have violated their code of ethics. And those complaints are handled by this commission, which has three, three lawyers that are uh, appointed by the bar, and then six members of the public who the governor appoints. So the public has a role in assuring that uh, our judges are, are in fact following the, the code of judicial conduct. And I think it's a um, it's critical that the public recognize that we have these obligations and that they are enforced because we don't have the trust and confidence of the public. We, we really have lost the, the, the importance of the judicial system. And, you know, it's, our founders were quoted as saying that the judicial branch is the weakest of the three branches. We don't have an army. We can't raise an army and we can't, uh, impose taxes. Uh, so we can't defend ourselves, so to speak. And the only thing we have is the trust and confidence of the public. And the, that trust and confidence, at least I believe, is, is justified because of the, this code of judicial conduct and the obligation that we have that judges follow it isn't perfect. Uh, it certainly has functioned in all states and in the federal system to to hopefully take action when there is a judge that uh, isn't, isn't following that code or perhaps has uh, uh, personal issues that cause them to be unable to, to perform their duties. So there are uh, rules established and systems in place to enforce those rules. Uh, recusals are part of that process because you have the right to disqualify a judge if they are not following the, the code of judicial conduct and recusal is the judge themselves taking themselves off the case because they may have a conflict of interest um, and that they're obligated to do if they have that. I, I found that was a, an interesting personal process to go through when I was first appointed of, you know, this, say this particular lawyers appearing in front of me, I had uh, friendship with them, or perhaps they were a former partner many years ago, would, would that affect my ability to make uh, the correct decision? And I was counseled by uh, my, my colleague and one of my mentors, Justice Golden, who said, if you have to think about it very hard, take yourself off the case. And I think that was good advice. Uh, so, and that's difficult in a state like Wyoming. We're a very small bar. You, you know everybody. Right, you know everybody, and I, and I did have one where it was an old uh, friend that I thought that was just just too too far removed because the judge also has and the and the code of conduct makes this clear the duty to sit, the duty to decide a case, and there are situations where the litigants might use the disqualification rule for strategic purposes, and if you really don't have a conflict, then you should not take yourself off the case. So. That's kind of how the, it operates, at least at the state level. And um, I think it's similar, and but maybe a little more complicated sure. at the federal level. Judge Johnson, you can expand upon that here. 
Well, if the uh, federal government can complicate things, we, we do it. Uh, <laughs> it, it. It's a real process, but we have many uh, benefits uh, and, and mechanisms as well to help the judge and avenues of uh, interpretation uh, from the uh, uh, Council of the Administrative Office of the United States Courts. Uh, we operate under a judicial code as well uh, to provide guidance to us. Uh, recently, you know, judges are human beings. We're isolated oftentimes. Uh, judges, uh, some judges get in trouble with uh, substances, alcohol, uh, and these cause problems. There are mechanisms to uh, uh, deal with those kinds of issues. There are issues of, uh, there's a whole process that we have in the Tenth Circuit anyway, and I think it exists in the Ninth Circuit as well, uh, for judicial health uh, and a process of uh, bringing these things to the attention of the chief judge if uh, in the district or and then ultimately to the circuit council, if necessary, uh, to deal with those kinds of issues. And ultimately, if the judge's conduct is one that raises issues as to behavior, serving, we serve upon good behavior uh, under the constitutional principle. Violate that. And then the matter can go on up to the uh, 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 the uh, Judicial Conference of the United States Courts, and ultimately, if, if necessary, a recommendation to the uh, Congress to uh, start impeachment proceedings. Uh, those cases, when they do arise, very seldom uh, go to, to impeachment, but oftentimes are, are resolved with a resignation right. uh, short of that. Uh, but uh, also recently <clears throat> adopted and amended in the uh, United States courts has been a whole process of bringing our attention to issues of fairness in the workplace, the treatment of the people around us. You would think judges don't need to be informed of that and that uh, Personnel who work in federal courts don't need to be reminded, but we do. And uh, those those uh, fair employment rules that we have uh, have been very good and have disclosed, as a matter of fact, issues that have existed in our federal system that have now been remedied. <clears throat> Thank you, Judge Johnson. Um, we have been able to weave some of our email questions into the questions that we've asked, but this is the final question we'll ask this evening. And it's a little bit different, but I think it's important. This is a, from a viewer in Wilson, Wyoming, who says, when, if ever, should there be restraints on the role of the courts in regards to individual rights? And anyone can take a crack at that. When, if ever, should there be restraint on the role of the courts in regards to individual rights? It's a broad question. You each may approach this topic from a different angle, um, depending on how they view, I guess, an individual right involved, maybe. Anyone want to take an, an, a crack at that? I guess I would say just generally, the, the, the nature of our individual rights are established by our constitution. Um, federal and state constitutions, the courts don't, uh, dream up, I guess, of uh, the rights they think should exist. So the question I think is, you know, is the court properly interpreting the constitution and its, its uh, limit on, and in its protection of the individual rights cr created? And I, I don't see, I'm, uh, some of the other judges might, might see it a little differently. I don't see that those are different than deciding any other case or any other issue. If you had, if let's say it's the right to free speech, you're you're looking at that from the standpoint of what did our what did our 
founders, what does the constitution mean with regard to those individual rights? We are not essentially creating new rights. So I, I don't see, I guess, the need for restriction of, of judges uh, in the area of individual rights. It's their obligation to enforce whatever the constitution provides. Thank you. Any other uh, extension on that question? Well, I wanna give each of you an opportunity to um, provide some summary to our conversation uh, this evening, um, perhaps answering the, the question briefly on what you hope viewers might take away from what they've heard tonight. Um, I'm just gonna go around my, my clock here and you can't see the order that you in that you are in, but Judge, Judge Malloy, you're first with that question, if you have a, a brief closing comment here. And uh, the closing comment is, what do I want people to take away from this? It, it can be, or anything else that you wanna make sure that, that you um, visit about this evening. Yeah, well, I think, first of all, thank you for hosting this. And I think you've done a marvelous job of raising the questions. And uh, this conversation has been going on for 220 years <laughs> about who has what power and how is it to be interpreted and when is it to be exercised? And that is a refreshing part of our democracy that we all can hopefully agree to disagree and have our own personal views, but somehow have a consensus. And I think <clears throat> these kinds of programs uh, lend themselves to uh, maybe a little bit better understanding of the complexity of uh, the judicial system. And uh, again, uh, my hope is that there's education and that people uh, can disagree and reasonably disagree, but accept uh, the fact that at some point when there's a dispute, there has to be a resolution. And I think the state courts and the uh, federal courts uh, add to that. I only have one other thing that I'd like to raise and that is, can you name the four constitutional offices under the United States Constitution? I'll give you a hint, the president, the Congress, the judges, and what's the fourth constitutional office? It's in two amendments, jurors. They are constitutional officers and our courts can't function without jurors, without the public, unsupported by uh, advertising or money contributions. They come in with their common sense we give them facts and they decide it. And it is a constitutional office. So thank you for hosting this. Uh, it's been very interesting. Judge Moy, thank you. Judge Johnson, you're next on my screen. Very well. Well, again, thank you for this opportunity to share time with the public and share time with you and with colleagues on the bench from both Montana and Wyoming, as well as uh, the distinguished former president of the American Bar Association, representing well over a million attorneys across this great nation. Uh, my experience has been that my colleagues, have, and I, which I share with them, have a desire to be fair and to make decisions that are not driven by political pressure or by public sentiment, to remain independent in their decision-making. We're constrained by the environment we live in uh, and the structure of the environment that is provided for us in the federal and state courts as institutions through the need to provide due process, through the rules that govern how litigation proceeds through the court, uh, and uh, through the work that we do, uh, 
the work is based on the evidence that we receive, on the rules that we receive that evidence and how that evidence is received. And the judges are bound to an ethical obligation to follow the law. And I hope that's been communicated for my colleague, colleagues tonight. Uh, it is an ethical obligation to follow the law in its application to the facts that are presented uh, to the judge. It is not so clear. And judges can dispute, can disagree, and uh, as litigants frequently do in the courtroom. And decisions uh, can vary from court to court. But uh, make no one should mistake that this is all done because of some political undercurrent or some secret agenda. These are people who are working hard to try to achieve proper answers and to seek that elusive uh, just result uh, for the people who appear before them. Uh, we have an amazing system in this country. Our federal system anyway provides so much for us. Jurors now receive uh, the evidence that's received in a case in a, in a means that they can display it in the court, in the uh, jury room, and all uh, look at every piece of evidence on a large screen. <coughs> we have every kind of uh, uh, device you can imagine for digital presentation of information during trial. And we have functioned quite well using uh, various electronic means during this time of COVID. With the exception, we miss our jurors and the ability to conduct jury trials. I've always been amazed that we have jurors in Wyoming who come to our court from distances up to 300 miles away and will be with us for a week or two weeks to complete a, a case and maintain interest. Uh, we allow jurors to ask questions. And uh, it is very interesting. Those questions sometimes are absolutely key that have been ignored right up to the point that the lawyers are seated in that trial. I feel very fortunate in my life to be able to associate with my fellow judges, to have a position where I am able to feel that I serve the public and do work that I feel is important. So I thank, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Judge Johnson. Thank you very much. Justice Kite, you're next on my screen, if you would. Yes, first of all, again, thank you. This is the kind of program that I think goes a long way towards enhancing that trust and confidence when people get a chance to, to really think about these issues. And, and to our listeners, I would say that, that there is a great deal more transparency in, at least in our state system, and I believe the federal as well, than there used to be just because of technology. And you can listen to trials all over the state as they are proceeding. You can listen to Wyoming Supreme Court arguments live. Um, and if you have a question, you, you know, about what happens in a case, you can look at the, at the uh, records and see them uh, digitally and understand instead of reading about them in whatever newspaper it is that you might follow and nobody reads a newspaper anymore, whatever source of news that you, that you mm -hmm. use, because I think you'll find once you get the, the real facts of what's going on in a case that, as Judge Johnson said, these are well-intentioned, uh, honest people working through the best system that's been created on this planet for justice. It isn't perfect, but as you learn more about it, I think you, uh, gain respect for the system itself, even if you disagree with a particular decision. So thank you, Craig, for allowing us to, to participate. Thank you, Justice Kite. Judge Friedenthal, closing comments and thoughts. <clears throat> thank you. I, uh, in terms of the takeaway from the program, I, I just want to reinforce the uh, point made by Justice Kite, which is the judiciary depends entirely on the public trust and confidence. 
uh, in, in the system. And the judiciary is the third branch of government in this wonderful and ingenious constitutional design of our founding fathers. We have a job to do to continue to uh, work hard to earn that trust and, and confidence. But I also think that the viewers have a job to do. We can't get out uh, in the field of public discourse and, and correct false information or misinformation about the judiciary, but the members of our bar can. And we need to be a partner in tending to our democracy because it's, it's uh, as, as I think Judge Johnson indicated, it, uh, there's a lot of, there, there, are, there are components of our democracy which are very fragile. And uh, public trust and confidence these days in all arenas is very low. And I think while technologies have improved transparency, we've got uh, problems with technology uh, advancing through social media, uh, false information, some of which is out there from our uh, enemies, both foreign and domestic. So uh, help us uh, protect uh, not only the, the democracy, but the individual liberties. Thank you, Judge Friedenthal. Judge Waters, your closing thoughts. Well, I just think that this is an, an outstanding way Craig to uh, get information out to people about what, how the judiciary works and how judges make decisions. And uh, it's kind of a complex branch of, of the government. And I really hope that the audience has learned something about the judiciary that they didn't know before tonight's program. And um, I would really encourage uh, members of the public to you know, the, the courtrooms are, are open. They are, we have almost everything we do is open to the public. I encourage you to come and watch some judicial proceedings. Uh, things got a little hairy with COVID and courthouses closed and so forth, but um, they're opening <clears throat> up and we welcome you to come and see how, how things really operate in the courtroom. And if you are, you get the call and you're selected as a juror or you have to come in and participate in that juror selection. Um, we all know it's a huge inconvenience for you and so forth. But in all of my years on the bench, I, every juror I've ever talked to has, has really thought it was a very rewarding experience. And trust me, I would say probably 99% of them come in hoping, oh, please don't pick me. But you know, when you're sitting in that jury box and you take that oath, uh, jurors take it very seriously and they work really hard to get at the right decision. And I truly believe that they, for almost all the time, get to the right decision. But if you have an opportunity to serve, I just really want to encourage you to try to make every effort to do so, um, because you'll really get an idea then about how how decisions are made in, in the courts and see how you know that fundamental aspect of our uh, judicial system, the jury trial, uh, what a significant role that plays. But I just hope you've learned something that you didn't maybe know before, or come to a better understanding of, of how judges make decisions and uh, the constraints that judges have on their ability to make decisions. And uh, I just thank you, Craig, for for giving me the opportunity to participate and for hosting this program. Thank you, Judge Waters. It was certainly our pleasure. At the risk of offending all of the judges on the panel, the attorney gets the last word, Mr. Carlson. <laughs> Completely random by Zoom, I'll say, but, yes. but certainly go ahead. I understand all. Thanks, Greg, and thanks for the, uh, for the invitation to participate on this very oh. talented uh, panel. Um, I guess my takeaway today, um, is this. Um, many Americans today, no matter what part of the uh, political spectrum they occupy, uh, believe American values face uh, historic threats. And we do face challenges as a nation. We are divided in so many areas. And at times, it seems like compromise is beyond reach. 
and that uh, our great experiment in democracy could falter. But at times like this, it is important to remember that powerful institutions of our democracy, an independent judiciary, the rule of law, free speech, and a free press have helped us weather political scandal and extremism that tested the central philosophies and traditions of American society. Our institutions have been tested and strained, but in the end, the rule of law has prevailed. Our system of checks and balances have held. When some checks fail to work, others ensure that our democracy was protected. Our institutions are strong, but they're not invincible. They still require the support and protection of the people to endure. And this is especially important in times like these when our democratic institutions are attacked by government officials and so-called experts and analysts who look to disrupt and mislead. Disparaging judges with personal rhetoric has no place in a democratic society. But if things sometimes seem hopeless, don't despair, but instead take action. We can accomplish this by returning the teaching of civics to our schools and defending our judges and other institutions from political attack. Our country will endure because citizens will continue to put in the work to sustain the institutions that uphold us. As Abraham Lincoln wisely said, it is with your aid as the people that I think we shall be able to preserve, not the country, for the country will preserve itself, but the institutions of the country, those institutions which have made us free, intelligent, and happy. And PBS, in my mind, is one of those institutions. And thanks for the work that you do in allowing this message to get out. Mr. Carlson, and to all of our panelists, thank you so very much for your time. Um, it's a busy time for all of us, but this discussion has been wonderfully um, educating for me, and I'm sure that our viewers are as well. I want to tell our viewers this will live on forever. It will be archived on the Wyoming PBS YouTube page. And again, it is also available at wyomingpbs.org slash justice. My thanks as well to Greg, attorney Greg Monroe from uh, attorney at law from Montana and to John Vincent from Wyoming. Uh, the genesis of this whole program evolved out of a phone call from uh, Mr. Vincent to Brad Tyndall, the president of Central Wyoming College, and here we are today. So this has been a wonderful discussion and I hope it's not the last, but to all of you, thank you so very much. And panelists, we'll end our meeting here. I, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks you. for all your hard work. Appreciate it. Thank hey, you, everybody. Thank, thank you. Have a wonderful thank evening. Thank you. Real pleasure. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Greg, I see you on the screen. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Hang on for just a moment here, and I'll make sure that.